So welcome everybody. My name is Michaela Moss. I'm the Acting Executive Director for the Friends of the Missouri Breaks Monument. Uh, we're a small nonprofit based out of Helena, Montana with the mission to protect and preserve the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument through stewardship, education, and advocacy. So thank you for joining us this evening for our sixth Tune In Tuesday um, event of this spring docket. And this will be the final one uh, for the spring session. And since January, these virtual events have been covering topics ranging from changing management of the monument to its wildlife and ecosystem structures to the history of our organization. Um, a reminder that you can find this Tune In Tuesday and all of our previous events on our YouTube channel, um, simply by typing in Friends of the Missouri Breaks Monument into your search bar. So if you didn't get a chance to check those out, make sure you jump online and you can watch all of those videos. Um, this evening, we're really fortunate to be discussing recreation on the monument with Allison Williams, the BLM's lead interpretive ranger for the monument. Um, thank you so much, Allison, for joining us tonight. This is going to be a super great way for us all to get excited and informed for the float season ahead of us. Um, a few quick reminders before we get started. I'm going to ask that everybody keeps themselves muted during the presentation to cut back on background noise and feedback. But if you do have a question or anything like that, you can type that into the chat box and we'll keep an eye out for it. Also, feel free to turn your videos on. We like to see faces and expressions. Um, a lot easier than talking to blank screens, um, but feel free to leave those off as well. And then uh, we will have time at the end of the discussion to go over audience questions. So at that point, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions that have popped up or um, again, type into the chat box and we'll get those answered. Um, and I think that is it for me. With that, I can hand things over to Allison. All right. Thank you, Michaela, for the warm introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. This is my first time doing the Tune In Tuesday, so I'm very excited to be able to share a little bit about our monument with you all. Um, as Michaela said, my name is Allison Williams, and I am the new lead interpretive park ranger here at the Upper Missouri River Breaks Interpretive Center in Fort Benton. And I've been here about three months now. So I hope that, you know, the knowledge I've gained and, and I'm going to share tonight will be full for you. And um, please, I encourage you to ask as many questions as you can. It's the, the best way that I learn about my site, um, as well as helping to, to share what I know with you all. So uh, we'll help each other tonight. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I am going to present uh, throughout, so my screen will probably get pretty tiny, um, but I felt like it's, you know, the best way to get you all excited about an upcoming river trip is to share the photos of this beautiful place and, and be able to, to really get that momentum going for the upcoming season. I'm going to share a lot of information that is probably familiar to most of you that have been along the river corridor, um, but it's good information for newcomers. And then I'll also maybe share a little bit of detail about the history that you might not have known or some, just maybe some general updates on what we're planning for the summer. Um, with that, I will go ahead and get started. So I'm going to share my screen. See if I can do it right. Okay. So we practice this. So I'm sharing and then I've got to um, do the display. Sometimes I feel like I'm totally new to technology. Okay, Michaela, this is where I can't see the display settings. Yeah. And then, um, okay. Did that do it? We're good. All right, cool. Okay, so this is my floater's guide to the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. And really, the uh, it just a little basic overview of our monument. The Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument is about 380,000 acres, and that includes that 149-mile stretch of wild and scenic river 
and also the uplands that surround that exciting part of river. We are part of the National Landscape Conservation System. Uh, and this, if you're not familiar with the NCLS, it is, or NLCS, pardon me, it is something that um, the BLM tends to, to uh, have as some, at some of their sites. And really the point of this program is to conserve, protect, and restore our nationally, nationally significant landscapes uh, and the places that have cultural, econo ecological, or scientific value. Um, and we protect these places much like the Park Service would for the benefit of current and future generations. So I think about the monument. I came from the Park Service uh, for, for about 15 years. And so when I came to this monument, I thought of it much like a national park. Um, it, is, it has many significant items, cultural, historical, uh, absolutely beautiful uh, landscape and something worth protecting. Um, because we are managed under a different agency, that means we do have different regulations and rules. So that's why you see multiple uses here on the monument um, that you might not see in a national park site. But we do get confused a lot with, with national park sites, um, which is fine because we feel like we're a park in that way. Um, but the, uh, within the monument, you not only have that, those ac that acreage in the Wild and Scenic River, but you also have the, the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, the Nez Perce National Historic Trail, you have the Cow Creek Island of an uh, area of environmental concern, and there's six wilderness study areas within the monument here. Um, we also have the town of Fort Benton as a National Historic Landmark, and that's right where our interpretive center sits in the town of Fort Benton. And then you've got the Missouri Breaks Backcountry Byway if you want to explore more of the monument, either uh, by vehicle and get out on foot a bit above the river. So a lot of exciting uh, opportunities to get out and, and get a bit of recreation and history within the monument. This is a good overview of, of our monument area. And you can see in the far left of your screen, you're looking at uh, where we sit in Fort Benton. Not a lot of that green space, that monument land around Fort Benton. And, but as you go follow the uh, river down toward Colbanks Landing, which is where most people start their journey along the uh, White Cliffs section, that's when it really opens up and you get more of that, that um, monument landscape as you're going all the way down toward the C.M. Russell Wildlife Refuge and the James Kipp Recreation Area. So pretty extensive landscape there and a lot to see. As you think about planning a trip for, uh, for the river, we really encourage everyone to, to get the boater's guides. And if you haven't seen these, you can purchase them here at the Interpretive Center um, we also have our outfitters, local outfitters, the Friends Group also sells these guides. So there's a lot of places you can find them both online and over the phone. Um, but these boaters guides are, are really great resources. I'm going to grab mine. Really great resources to take down the river with you. Um, they're, they're full of not just information on, you know, where to camp and, and uh, you know, what river mile you're at, but they have a lot of history in them as well. Um, there's, there's great descriptions of the Lewis and Clark expedition coming up the river, all of the Cora Discovery campsites that they, they stayed at. Um, there's information on the local flora and fauna. There's, there's hikes, a uh, recommendation for hikes that you can do from each of the campsites. So there's really, it's a full book in my opinion. And there's one for the upper section from Fort Benton down to Judith Landing. And then the other lower section, which is from Judith down to Kip. So um, taking these with you is, shouldn't be a problem. They're pretty waterproof, uh, which is a good thing. Of course, you could get little tears on them, but um, for the most part, they're a very sturdy book and I recommend them. But for further information beyond that, if you all uh, ever have questions, please do call us. Um, our phone number is listed on this slide, and I know this is being recorded, so hopefully you can find these again, uh, these slides. But um, our number is 622-4000, and you'll get a live person to talk to and, and answer questions. And of course, we can also be found online, and a simple Google search for the monument will help you get there. Our boaters guides are also available digitally. So if you go onto our website, you can find them. They just won't have those nice 
fold out sections of maps. So you'll have the other maps that are on each page, but you won't get the fold out section uh, that's included. But otherwise, great, great resource there. So that's that's really what you want to do is, is to start to prepare, think about your trip um, and and start getting those tools together to help you plan and get excited, which means visiting the website, talking to friends, our friends group, talking to our, our um, rangers here on site and then getting some guidebooks to help you plan. Now, if you're just starting out and this is your first time ever doing this river, we've got some tips on what you can bring along with your journey. Uh, the basics, of course, you want to paddle for each person in your boat, as well as extras. You might lose a paddle along the way, although there isn't really any white water on this river. It's a class one river, uh, but you might get a little, uh, you know, distracted, look away and the wind could carry your paddle away or any number of things could happen. So just having an extra paddle with you is a good idea. Um, of course, a, a PFD, a personal flotation device per person, maybe an extra if you feel like uh, one of yours isn't doing a solid job. They're also nice to have if you want to take a dip in the river, uh, take um, your, your PFD with you and float down the river a bit. So having those is important. A good solid seat, you're going to be doing a lot of cruising, a lot of looking around and floating. So you want to have a good backrest with you. Um, I, I suggest that at least when I go out, I really need a good backrest. Knee pads, um, you know, we recommend them if you're going to be in a craft that requires you to get down. Mostly that's whitewater canoeing, but if you have a craft that where you're going to be on your knees, then you're going to want some knee pads um, for this trip. It's a pretty long trek. Dry bags for all of your gear. I suggest multiple sizes. Weather and VHF radio, you'll want signaling devices, mirror, whistle, flares, emergency floating throw line, just in case you get into some of those hairy situations in the rapids that they call on the river, but they're, they're just ripples really with a swift current. Um, large sponge and a baler, that's really good. I, we get a lot of water in our canoe, our dogs mostly drag it in, but um, it's always nice to, to be able to get that water out as you're going along. And then the anchor stakes with rope. Uh, most people don't realize how swift the current is. When you look out at the river, it seems pretty, pretty mild, but it can actually, as you um, portage up to the shore, it can actually start to uh, drift away. So you'll wanna make sure that you, you have your boat tied and secured when you go up onto shore. So the uh, personal basics we recommend, um, it's a long list and I do encourage you to come back to this if you can. Uh, this video, if you really want to write down all this, um, the list, I'm not going to hover over it too long, but thinking about being in the sun, you're going to be in the sun for most of this journey. Uh, if it's a good sunny summer, which it <laughs> most likely will be, gets pretty hot. So just making sure you have that good hat and sunglasses, long sleeve shirt and pants to keep you protected. Uh, also that sunscreen and lip balm. Yeah, weather can change pretty quickly on the river and because you're in a narrow canyon in a lot of parts, you can't see it coming um, a lot of times and it sneaks up on you. So just making sure that you've checked the weather before your trip and if it looks like you might have a chance bringing that rain protection with you just in case. The other uh, good part of that is it, we get a lot of wind in this area. And so your rain gear could be used to also keep you a little bit blocked from the wind. Uh, so it's a nice thing to have with you. You're going to want uh, luggable toilet products. And, and what that means is, and we're going to go over probably some of these things. I'm going to beat a dead horse on this because these are uh, important parts of our river corridor. Most of us are taught in uh, the wilderness, we can um, dig and bury our scat, I will say, our waste. And on the Missouri River, you are not allowed to do that through our uh, wild and scenic section. So there's no, no um, digging a latrine or, um, you know, burying anything. We, we pack it all out. So wag bag and, um, is something that is common around here that people use. It's a, a bag that seals up your waste and you can safely take out of the back country. Um, there are also dry bags, watertight groovers, which is a PVC pipe. Um, and, and so we could go through more of that with you if you call us and are interested to get more info. We have information and brochures on that. 
Uh, we recommend bringing toilet paper just because a lot of times our rangers can't get out to every site that has a pit toilet on the river more than once a week. So if, uh, if it's a crowded heavy use, we try to keep it really stocked, but sometimes um, that disappears faster than we can anticipate. So just if you're worried about that, you might want to bring some extra um, water, of course, and a water bottle. We recommend a gallon per person per day. And this is another really big point to emphasize. The um, water in the Missouri River is not potable. It's not something that you want to filter and drink. It's heavy with sediment. Agricultural runoff and cattle grazing happens uh, for hundreds of thousands of acres upstream. So, so a lot of runoff into our river, it doesn't make it safe to drink. Um, so you'll want to bring a gallon per person per day with you and extra for cooking. Um, maps and charts, you'll want to bring, of course, our guidebook has the maps that you, you might want uh, in them. And then your wayfinding, if you have any wayfinding gear, compass, GPS, waterproof matches, lighters, knife and a multi-tool, multi-function watch, a headlamp at night. Uh, we do have rattlesnakes. Um, the prairie rattlesnake is prevalent throughout the monument. So just making sure you're watching where you step at night. And then your first aid supplies, bug repellent. Mosquitoes are soon to start coming out here. So I'd say if you're planning a trip soon, make sure you got good bug repellent. And then food, you'll want to keep in a critter-proof container. Mostly uh, you're, gonna, you're thinking about mice in this situation. We don't have a whole lot of, of um, bear activity. It can happen on the river corridor, but it's not common. Um, but you definitely want to keep your, your food just away from any animals that might find it uh, intriguing. Bring your snacks with you, a small dry box, and your boater's guide. And then some optional items um, and camp basics. You'll, you know, for camping, there are some areas that have shelters that you could, you could camp under. And those areas, um, you know, don't tend to have a lot of shade. So that's a, an area people use for cooking and um, just getting out of the sun. But you'll want to bring your tent and rain fly with you, a good tarp. Um, of course, your sleeping bag and uh, pad. Some people might just want to sleep out under the stars, and that's understandable, and, and I, I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Um, and then some rope, extra rope, a kitchen mat for cooking, your stove, fuel utensils, and your uh, gray water strainer if you have it, trash bags, and antibacterial soap so we don't add to the problem in the river. The optional items, uh, which I they're not optional for me, at least. Binoculars are a big deal. This river attracts a lot of birds, a lot of raptors. You'll see eagles and osprey um, flying by. You'll see a lot of waterfowl and songbirds. So if you're a big birder, bring, bring your binoculars. It also just helps you get a better look at the surrounding scenery. A good camera, a journal and a sketchbook, a towel for if you want to take a dip in the water or if you just accidentally get wet. Um, camp chair, and then uh, some good guidebooks to help you identify the plants and animals around, as well as the geology along the cliffs, and a good satellite phone or spot device if you have one. I went really far. Okay, so a few reminders out there. Um, do not expect any cell phone service within the river corridor. There are some areas if you were feeling really um, adventurous and wanted to climb up to the top of the bluffs, you might get some service up, up at the top, but that's not a guarantee. So uh, just don't expect to have that while you're on your trip. Leave your itinerary with someone that is not going with you on your journey so that they can uh, let them know where you're going, how many days you'll be gone, and when you expect to be back and touching base with them so that they can alert people if need be, if, if you don't show up. Um, we recommend you bring either a watertight box like a pelican case or something similar or sealed plastic bags like those dry bags or even Ziploc bags um, just so you can keep a lot of your gear that maybe you want to access, uh, you know, occasionally you can keep that safe as you're floating down the river. Uh, I like to keep my, my camera and my phone. Um, I, I take my phone because I use it a lot as a camera. Um, so those kinds of things, snacks, things you don't want to get wet, just keep them in the watertight areas. Ensure all of your equipment is working before you leave. 
Uh, for myself, I have been in that situation where I've taken a tent, I grabbed my tent and went off on an adventure with some friends and we got to the campsite and my poles were not in my tent. So uh, my tent bag. So you don't want to be me and sleep all night with mosquitoes breaking through your, your netting on your tent uh, without poles. So make sure you check everything. It's in working order and that you uh, that it's all ready to go for your trip. If you're curious about lengths of time, most people take about three to four days to travel from Coal Banks Landing to Judith Landing. And that's what we call the White Cliff section. So uh, I encourage people if they have the time to take more time. Um, there are a lot of really fascinating things to see along the way. Stops to get out and check out that history. Check, there are teepee rings that overlook the river that you can hike up to and slot canyons and pictographs. Um, and so it's just really a, a great thing to be able to take your time and enjoy that and not feel rushed to get down to, to point B. Um, you know, once you're, you're on the river. So I always recommend a little longer. If you were to do the lower section from Judith to Kip, we say it usually takes four to five days. So all in all, you're, you're looking at a seven to nine day trip, depending on, you know, how long you want to be out there. Um, river permit fees, right now they're, they're, they have stayed steady. Adults are $4 per person per day and children seven to 15 are $2 per person per day, and then children under seven are free. So when you fill out that permit, um, the self-permit stations at each site, you'll see the blue envelopes and you'll fill that out. And so that's each day on the river that it's $4 per person. And unfortunately, none of the national park passes, those America the Beautiful passes, none of those work for um, reducing fees or um, having a free entrance for this specific fee. If you were to camp at some of our sites, then uh, then you might get some of the discounts for that. Like the, I think the, um, the senior pass will get 50% off at our campsites. From June 15th to August 1st, we have restrictions. Groups larger than 20 can launch only on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Um, and if you, if, this, if you fall under this category and are curious about this, please call us. We have a new outdoor recreation planner that can go through all of this information with you. He's much more knowledgeable about this than I am. Um, but groups larger than 30, you must obtain a special recreation permit. Uh, and for organized groups, we ask that we have a letter of agreement. Um, and of course, as we had talked about before, give us a call or, or email us or, um, or just come in and, and say hi and we can give you more information. And, and if you're looking for a guide to lead you down the trip, we can help you with that as well. So there are a few special considerations that I wanna go over. Um, these are, I, I, again, I'm probably gonna repeat myself on some of these things, but I just think they're really important. Um, rattlesnakes, uh, again, prairie rattlesnakes are prevalent throughout. I um, have been really fortunate to never been bothered by them, but that's just my experience. Um, you know, I would say the biggest thing is watch where you step. And if you're climbing any rocks or on a hike, just watch where you place your hands. They like to be around rocks. Um, and, and just make sure you're, you're paying attention to your surroundings. There are other snakes in the monument that can behave like rattlesnakes. Um, so it's really just best to keep your distance and don't harass them and let them have as much space as, as they need. The other thing, I've got a little icon there at, for wind. Um, it was really hard to figure or find a photo to portray the heavy winds that we do get on the river corridor. Um, and they can be a tailwind, which is a blessing, or they can be a headwind, which will just kind of anger you <laughs> throughout the day. So you've really got to be prepared, or a sidewind, I guess. I didn't throw that in there, but you just have to be prepared um, for windy conditions. Uh, it happens a lot, and, and most of the time it picks up later in the day, so the mornings might be a nice quiet morning, but be prepared for winds at some portion of your trip. Lightning and thunderstorms are definitely something we experience in the summer. Uh, you can see that photo is on the Missouri River there of the lightning coming down. And, uh, and so you just want to make sure that you're, you're able to find, you know, good shelter. The biggest thing is get off the river. 
Um, you don't want to you don't want to hide under a tree. That's not recommended. But mainly get off the water and just try to sh uh, hunker down, shelter you know on the ground as much as you can. There is a lightning pose I've heard about, and I'm not going to go through it. But it's something you can look up online if you ever find yourself uh, want to know how to, I guess, react in a lightning storm if you're out in the open. Um, there are ways to prepare for that. Poison ivy, that was a new one for me. I didn't realize it was here last year and I wandered right through a thicket of it uh, and, and used the restroom in it. So that was a very exciting experience. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I have learned now that it is everywhere in the, in the river corridor. I've actually seen islands that are full of it. Um, the understory is just thick with poison ivy. So um, making sure you're, you're being aware of that, those three leaves, uh, that's a big tell, tell sign of poison ivy, and it is prevalent. Um, so I guess a tip on that would just bring, if, if you think you might get into some bad poison ivy situations, you might want to have some, some lotion for that in case, some anti-itch. And then the last thing is the gumbo mud. And anybody that has been on the river or around knows of this bentonite clay that is all along the river corridor. And when it gets wet, which of course it's next to the river, so it's wet all the time, gets to be a mucky mess. And it is very difficult to walk through this, uh, this soil, that is this wet soil that is around the river. Um, you can see the gentleman in the life jacket there is just, he is basically falling down into a hole almost. Um, so just, you know, bringing good shoes for that. Uh, people bring all sorts of shoes. They bring Chaco or Tiva sandals. Some people bring rain boots to deal with this type of um, situation. You know, we recommend hiking shoes off, off of the river corridor and into the uplands, but, but for the river, prepare for this. It might just be, you know, you might feel more comfortable going barefoot for a moment until you get up on shore, um, but be prepared for mucky and muddy conditions. Um, and that, that kind of brings me, I didn't show a picture, not that, not that I know I have one, but um, there is one thing I read recently that was kind of uh, concerning, and Michaela or someone else might know the correct term for it, but there are sinkholes of a sort along the river uh, edge that can happen, at, or so I've read, um, where you could actually, uh, you know, there are large holes that go down to water, um, and, the, and they can go for hundreds of yards underground, these, these um sinkholes. So I, um, I would say watch out for that as well. From what I read, they can be covered up by sage and um, other bushes. Uh, so, so definitely something to keep an eye out for. Just always watching where you're going um, when you're off the main river there. So just some quick public access. Your principal launch points are going to be either in Fort Benton here. We have two sites, the canoe launch, which is on the west side of town, and then the main uh, boat launch, which is actually right downtown across the street from the old fort. So those are two places you could launch if you wanted to launch here in Fort Benton. Now, a lot of folks will do a day trip just from Fort Benton to Woodbottom. And you can see on the mileage there, that's a 20 mile day. So it probably takes about four or five hours uh, if, you're, if you're rowing the whole time or um, paddling. So that's a nice day float. Beyond that is Colbank's Landing. That is, like I had mentioned, our main put-in. And so that one can get quite busy in the summer. Uh, there, is, there are campground hosts at that site that can help you uh, answer any questions that you may have or, or help you get um, reach emergency services if you need it. Or, you know, they can do any number of things to help you out, provide extra information. Um, there, are, there are toilet services at that. So you've got the pit toilet or the... Um, I'm, I'm spacing the other name for Pitot, but that's okay. Um, and then you have the next point, as you can see beyond that is Judith. So another 46 miles, 47 miles down, um, down the river there is Judith Landing. So once you've committed at Colbanks, you're pretty much on the river for the next few days. And then after Judith, that's, that is the lower section. Um, that's that area that is much more... I would say wild. Um, it's you're not going to see as many folks on that stretch of the river. So if you want solitude, that's that might be something that's more up your alley. That's also an area that they 
say is more like the Badlands. Um, so you've got a lot more of that breaks country, a uh, good mix of pine, uh, juniper trees going on down there and bighorn sheep. That's a really big draw to that area is, is more options to see bighorn sheep. So thinking about that section, you're, you would put in at Judith and then you'd take out at James Kip at River Mile 149. Now there are additional launch points that are not part of our um, site, which is Virgil Ferry right near Colbanks there. And then the McClellan Stafford Ferry is a bit farther down at mile 101. So those are some other areas that you can access the river by car if you need to. Now there's four different types of camping opportunities along the river. Um, the, the level one is the developed, the most developed public access, um, access sites and campgrounds. And they are all accessible by road and they have a full range of developments that in, can include the parking lots, boat ramps, vault toilets, that's that other name for the pit toilet, uh, campsites for tents and RVs and, and your picnic facilities for day users as well. We have a couple here in Fort Benton, the canoe launches one. Um, I don't know why the motorboat area is on there. I guess because it has, it's not a campground, but it does have uh, the pit toilet area and parking. Um, Wood Bottom, also coal banks. And then Lower Woodhawk is one and Judith Landing and then James Kip. So those are our most developed public sites. Level two are going to be a little, they're developed like those ones you can reach by vehicle, but these are only accessible by your boat. So they're not going to have parking or anything like that, but they are going to have the vault toilets they're gonna have good campsites that are well established that are going to have the metal fire rings for your uh, use. Um, and occasionally, like I had mentioned earlier, they might have the open air shelters. So those are sites like Little Sandy, Lone Tree Coulee, Eagle Creek, Hole in the Wall, and Slaughter River. Now we're getting a little more primitive. So we've got level three is the, are the primitive boat camps. And these are ones that are actually named. They're accessible only by your boat but they uh, have a metal fire ring and beyond that you're on your own. So thinking about uh, your experience, it's something to consider. Do you wanna be in the areas that are more developed? A lot of us like to have access to facilities for sure. Um, but if you want a, a quieter experience, then you might wanna start looking at these primitive sites like Evans Bend, Seniors Reach, Black Bluff, uh, Pablo Rapids, Dark Butte, The Wall, McGarry Bar, Yes, bottom, upper Woodhock and hideaway. So those are, those are quite a few areas you can get away from people. Um, again, you know, you're carrying your waste out either way. So, uh, you know, if you happen to be able to go to the bathroom at one of the vault toilets, great, but you know, I don't think it's too big of a difference to, to camp at one of the primitive sites. And then the last one, of course, are our dispersed lands. Um, these, this is where you uh, are able to just choose your site. And I think that's what's really special about the monument here is we're not restrictive on where you can and can't go and camp. And, and that to me is really what provides the best wilderness experience when you try to find it on your own. There are some leave no trace um, ethics that you should follow if you are to disperse camp. Um, you know, the camping, as we talked about, it is permissible. There are some restrictions that we have as far as eagle nesting, um, which is going to, you know, which is actually occurring now. We haven't, our biologist hasn't identified all of the areas that are active this year. He's, he's asking for help from, from everyone to try to figure out what areas are, have active nests. But we do have eagle nesting uh, restrictions and those can be found in the guidebook as well as calling us to find out which ones we, we know are active. Um, but other than that, you, you, know, the, you are able to go out and, and find places that are um, suitable for, for a campsite. We ask that you try to find places that look like, you know, they have a durable surface. So you're not putting your tent on any vegetation and trampling vegetation while you're out there. If you see a site that ha already has a fire ring, great. Go ahead and use it. 
Um, if you have to build a fire ring um, by putting some rocks in a circle, the best thing you can do is try to get rid of that evidence when you leave. Um, so it's, you know, you would think it's nice to leave it for the next person, but it's much better if you can just build a really small contained fire and then disperse those rocks and the ashes when you leave, making sure everything is completely out cold to the touch before you do so. Um, the best option for a fire at a dispersed site is going to be using your camp stove um, just to cook and, and heat if you need it, but hopefully you bought, brought some good layers so you don't need that. Um, but basically what you're doing is you just want to make it so that you aren't, your presence wasn't detected um, after you leave. So I encourage dispersed camping. I think it's awesome that we can do that, but just be careful and, and try to practice good leave no trace ethics. A little bit more on just camping etiquette in general. Um, we do get a lot of use on this river in the summer, so it's not uncommon to see a lot of people on your journey. Um, and uh, going back to that camping, just making sure you're camping on those durable surfaces. If you can find gravelly or sandy or compacted areas, then do so. Um, concentrating your use on existing campsites. And that is also, uh, if you have a large group of folks, make sure you're keeping your tents closer together so that you're not spreading out into the, the foliage there and, and actually starting to damage some of the vegetation. Um, and then, which gets to that other point, focusing where the vegetation is absent um, and minimizing your campfire impacts by using a stove if you need to, if you're in a dispersed area. Using dead and down wood, that's a big one. Our cottonwood trees, which I'm gonna talk a bit, uh, bit about at the end, those are a very valuable resource here on the river. They don't regenerate like they have historically uh, in this area. And so as Michaela can attest, and as many of you, if, if you're on the board or have helped volunteer planting cottonwoods, it's a, it's a big job to try to keep these trees uh, a prevalent force on this river and to keep them growing and healthy. And to, to, we have to kind of give them a boost to get there because the natural process has broken down and, and is no longer uh, a big part of their life cycle. So um, don't cut any cottonwoods. I hate to say don't, but just um, you know being aware of the fact that our cottonwood trees are a valuable resource and, and trying to find all the dead and down wood that you can. It is perfectly acceptable to collect wood as you float down the river. So if you pull out for a restroom break and you see some good wood that you think would be good for a fire, go ahead and load it on the canoe if you can and take it on down to your next site um, where you'll be having your fire. So that is totally okay. Um, never leave a fire unattended. So that is a story that happened, um, you know, here at Evans Bend, uh, there was, was a fire in 2015, and that fire destroyed 40 acres of mature cottonwood trees. And so if you float down that section of river and you see Evans Bend, you'll see it is just completely barren of, of uh, live trees. Now it's just old uh, snags in that area. So um, being very cognizant of your fire and, and not leaving it unattended and making sure it is out cold to the touch. You have a wonderful resource right there at the river to get water and, and, and bring it up to your site. And I don't know if you all have seen those collapsible buckets, but those are really great to take on a canoe trip because they compact so small, but yet fill up a lot of water, uh, a couple gallons at least, to get up to your campsite to put out your fire. So I recommend those collapsible buckets. Um, leave your campsite clean. And I like to say better than you found it. Um, when I go camping, I try to remember to pick up all of the micro trash I see and put it in a little bag and take it home with me so that the next person doesn't have the experience I did in finding a lot of trash. Um, we all like to go out into the wilderness, of course, to get away from, from those uh, human impacts. And so trying to find, leave it better if you can is great. Um, but otherwise, just taking what, packing in what, or packing out what you pack in is the best you can do, then that's just fine. Um, respect other visitors and their experience. So not bring in loud boom boxes or, or making a lot of boisterous noise while you're out there. Um, it really helps everyone else enjoy that solitude and that really quiet experience that you get on the river. 
We talked about leaving larger campsites for larger groups or, or at least um, making your tents, putting them a bit closer together to leave room for others. Control your pets or leave them at home, but pets are welcome on the river. Um, so I say bring them and just make sure that they're at least under your control um, when they're out there and they're not running all over everybody else's experience because my dogs actually would do that. So I have to control them. Um, so uh, again, pack it in or pack it out. Now the human waste, that's the fun one to talk about. Everybody loves the, the portable toilet, um, but the portable toilet regulations are in effect for boaters on overnight trips um, throughout the entire 149 wild and scenic miles. So making sure that you have some form of a portable toilet or waste, uh, disposable waste um, bag with you is the best you can do. Um, your portable toilets, if you use them, must be washable, reusable, and a, or an approved degradable bag system. And that has to be specifically designed for human waste. So really uh, research that, make sure you have the right products before you set out on your trip. The big thing is vault toilets aren't authorized dump stations. So a lot of people will have the bags with them and think it's okay to throw them into the vault toilets, but vault toilet cleaning is a terrible job that our river rangers have to do. And it just makes their job that much harder. It doesn't allow the waste system to uh, break down properly if there's a lot of foreign objects in it. So just making sure you're taking everything out with you. Now you can dispose of waste bag systems at some of our dumpsters like Coal Banks Landing, Judith, and James Kipp. So at the end of your trip at Judith, there is a dumpster where you can dispose of that. Um, there all, it also mentions where the vault toilets are on the river. So if you, you know, can time your restroom breaks, then good, that would work for you. But most of us can't. So um, if you're lucky enough to be at one, then definitely use those. And you can see in the photo I had put the reason you see so much toilet paper stacked around, it looks kind of like a mess, but that's just our rangers trying to make sure that you all don't run out out there um, because they do get stolen quite often um, and used up. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to put as much out there as we possibly can each time we stop and, and refill for you. Um, but we do recommend bringing your own just in case. Now I won't go through all of the, the basic leave no trace, but because um, it's going to, again, just really reiterate a lot of stuff I've talked about, but just making sure you're planning really well before you leave, looking at the weather, got your maps, um, making sure you've got the right waste receptacle. And then when you get out there, making sure you're traveling on the established trails. There are a lot of social trails throughout the monument. So, um, you know, following the trails that are there. If you know they lead to that, or if they look like they're leading to the right um, area you're going, try to stay on those. Disposing of that waste properly, not throwing any food scraps or toilet paper or anything into your fire or down into the, uh, the vault toilet. Um, a lot of times you do find trash in fire rings and, and that doesn't break down well. Uh, a lot of times animals will get into it and get habituated. So, so just taking everything with you Leaving what you find, um, we have a lot of cultural artifacts that are strewn throughout the monument. And so you might come across some of these and um, just making sure you leave those and, and don't deface any of those features that you're gonna see, the pictographs or, or um, petroglyphs. Um, leaving flowers, I know it seems a lot of folks like to pick wildflowers, but if we all picked a wildflower and there was nothing left for the folks behind us to view, it wouldn't make their experience very good. So just remembering that there's other people coming behind you and they would like to see that beautiful scenery as well. Um, I always love the take only pictures, leave only footprints. I think that's a neat one. Um, Minimizing your campfire impacts. I don't know what kind of season this is going to be um, this year. We've gotten reports, you know, that it is going to be a drier spring, which is unfortunate because we just went through a dry winter. So uh, even though our snowpack around here was around 100%, at least up into the eastern front there, um, and, and out toward the plains here, I'm not sure what that means for our fire season, but it's sounding like it's going to be drier. So just remembering that if you go out on the river this year that, that there might be more restrictions in place um, and make sure you're just really careful with any flames. 
Um, respecting wildlife, observe them all from a distance. That includes the cows that you might see grazing um, out there and, and just making sure you're not feeding them and letting them have their space. And then again, being considerate of others. So let's let the journey begin. So that's a lot of prep. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot that goes into a river trip and a lot of things to consider, especially in an area as vast as this. Um, just getting from point A to point B by car can take hours. So a lot of pre uh, preparing it for that. And um, if you do need a shuttle ever, please let us know. We have a list of outfitters that can provide shuttles for you. But um, that's something I didn't cover was the fact that you might have to, you know, shuttle your vehicle yourself. And that's a, it's a large distance to cover. So a lot of planning. Um, but I like more of the... Um, I guess the adventure part of, of the journey. And so that's what we're gonna talk about from here on out is really that uh, history that draws us into this area and tells a story. And you uh, are floating through a living museum, as I've said here, uh, it's an area of stark contrasts and you're gonna see that all of it as you float down, even if you just had time to float through the White Cliff section um, or do a day trip here from here to, to Wood Bottom, you'll still see a lot of that contrast. Um, geology is probably the most prevalent part of, of the river. It's, it's in your face all day, every day with the cliffs and the hills um, and, and the different colors of soil and rock. So you're gonna see a lot of that geology as you move through the area. And when you're moving through the, the river corridor, it's, it's fun to imagine that this whole area used to be covered by a giant inland sea. And all the way, you know, across the plains here, up toward Glacier, just a giant inland sea, uh, very shallow um, sea that covered the area. And so, you, you know, trying to imagine this area that was more flat and just a vast body of water, uh, is hard because right now we see a lot of cliffs and mountains and, and definite definition across the landscape. But that is how it started here uh, millennia ago. And, um, and we're talking millions and millions of years ago. But over time, all of that, uh, the sediment that was in that sea started to get really compacted uh, and create rock. And as the sea receded, that rock was left behind. And then you had, of course, the geologic forces of, of tilting and sliding and folding. And all of these layers were uplifted to create this beautiful landscape that was also impacted and shaped by erosion, like wind and rain. So over all of these millions of years, this area was thrust up and then kind of eroded back down to the area that we see today. Um, that is my very short geology uh, talk, but it's interesting. There's volcanic history here in that bentonite clay, that gumbo, um, and that, that really uh, originated um, from what I've read, the Helena region. Uh, you know, a lot of our ash came from that area, so uh, it's interesting to find that volcanic activity here, um, and, and then, you know, moving on, as you see, the river rocks and the polished rocks are going to be green or red, uh, in color, it's, you know, there's a lot here and it would take me probably two hours to go into more depth on that, which we can't do. But if you're a geology hound or a rock hound, then you're going to have a good time on the river for sure. Um, there used to be, historically, there were bison, grizzly bear, and wolves that roamed the banks of this river. So imagining that scene as well. Think about Lewis and Clark. Think about the native people that were here when that took place, uh, you know, it's, it's really an interesting thing to imagine a grizzly bear or a wolf coming up to the shore. And that's something that did happen. And you'll find remnants mostly of the bison um, that were through this area. So you might find bones or skulls uh, from, those, from those animals that used to range all the way out here in the plains and along the river. Now, you know, around that time of the bison and grizzly and wolves, uh, there were native people that lived along the river. So we had quite a few tribes that lived in the area. Um, and the human occupation of this area began over 12,000 years ago. So that's a lot of, of years that these people called the Missouri, Upper Missouri area their home. The main tribe in the area were the Blackfeet. 
And um, we, we know, uh, you know, now the Blackfeet mostly are on that eastern side of the Continental Divide on the uh, eastern edge of Glacier National Park, but their range was all the way out here uh, into the plains. And so this was the Blackfeet territory mostly. You also had the Nakoda, the White Clay, the Crow, the Plains, and the Cree uh, Indians mostly in this area. Now, what was interesting is that there was sort of a cooperative um, agreement, I guess, above, uh, uh, between the tribes to have a shared hunting landscape as well, or a shared hunting ground. So uh, the people that took advantage of that were the Lakota, the Mandan, the Arakara, and the, I think this is the Hidatsa. I'm, I'm so sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, and they came mostly from the east, eastern side, so even farther out into the plains, whereas the Kootenai, the Salish, the Nimipu, and the Kalispell, as well as the Shoshone, they came from the west, so they came from those more mountainous regions and over into where Oregon and Washington are, Washington are now. Um, so it was really an interesting shared area. It was That tells you, in my opinion, how rich the wildlife was in this area on this landscape. So think about that when you go down the river. It's, gosh, it was probably just lousy with bison and <laughs> grizzly bear and wolves. Um, probably a good chance to see all of them. Um, among other animals as well. You've got a lot of ungulates, the deer and the elk um, that, that roam through. So you'll see remnants. That's what we're going to see nowadays is just the, the what's left over from that time period. But it's cool that we get to glimpse that. We get to see it. And so you might come across religious sites, uh, burial sites. You will see pictographs if you hike up some of the coolies around Eagle Creek, um, petroglyphs, riverside uh, habitation sites, those teepee rings I talked about that look over the river. Um, you might see some cairns and buffalo jumps and corrals. So really keep an eye out for the remnants of, of the people that used to be here and, and respect that landscape that was their home um, by keeping this place safe and, and protected for, for other people to, to be able to experience. Now, as the years went by and we're moving into the early 1800s, we had the Lewis and Clark expedition, the Corps of Discovery, and they were tasked with setting out west. Um, they, were, they were tasked with going to look for a passage to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it was specifically a northwest passage. So they were starting out in St. Louis and making their way up river. So imagine that in keelboats coming up river, um, you know, moving along, um, having to move along through that gumbo that we saw photos of earlier, where it's very mucky and muddy and and um, trying to push your way up a swift current river. And this was before the river was dammed. So of course it was probably a much more wild um, and, and could have definitely more obstacles. At that time, there was a lot more driftwood in the river. Uh, so definitely a, a much harder trek than it would be today to, to try to go up river. They made their trek through this part of the monument in 18 or in this part of the, the river through the monument section from 1805 is when they went up river and then 1806 as they headed back down. Um, but again, their goal was just to follow the Missouri River, try to find a passage over to the Columbia River and then make their way onto the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I had put a little excerpt here. You can see where um, Captain Clark was able to actually hike above where Bullwacker Creek is right now and spot the Rocky Mountains for the first time. And that's that's really special to me. I am a, a southeastern gal my whole life. And when I came out to work at Glacier, that was my first job, was in uh, Glacier National Park. And when I drove across the plains that seemed to never end, I finally remember seeing the first glimpse of the Rocky Mountains across the plains and I'm tearing up. I, it was just so, it was very special for me to, to see that. So I can imagine how he felt um, to see that massive, uh, you know, line of mountains in, in the far distance for the first time. So because Lewis and Clark made their journey through here, um, again, too much history to go into in any, any real depth, but the guidebook will go in a lot more depth on each of their core of discovery campsites and what they saw along the way, and it shares a lot of their journal entry as well. 
So it, it really is their own words in, in here. Um, but because they came through here, we're, we're part of that Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. And uh, there are many different entities that manage Lewis and Clark sites and mostly the Park Service, but we are um, a sister site and, and work closely with them as well. Now, Lewis and Clark really opened up the West to exploration. Um, at right on the tail ends of Lewis and Clark, fur traders started making their way up the river and out into this area. There were many trading posts and military posts that were built behind them. Um, and so you'll, you'll won't, you know, Fort Benton is the fort that you can see today, but along the river, you're not gonna really see any of these forts that were constructed. Um, one of the main ones, Fort McKenzie, is down near uh, this ooh, River Mile 14, I think that one was. And then, um, was it Pegan? Yeah, Fort Pegan, it's in the photo, um, was the one at Decision Point area where the, the confluence of the Missouri and the Marias River come in. Um, so those, you know, those aren't there anymore. And honestly, some of those forts didn't last very long. Some of them were highly successful because of the fur trading uh, industry, I guess I could say, that followed. Um, but basically, these, these folks came upriver in all sorts of vessels. And over the next two decades after Lewis and Clark, they really, uh, they really started to spread out on the landscape and hunt beaver, uh, grizzly bear, wolves. Um, all the way down to mice, they were, they were pretty much trapping anything that they could find and using those furs to trade with the, the local tribes in the area. Um, you know, uh, they would also um, send that, well, mostly they would send the fur down river um, back to St. Louis. So they were, they were, you can see in the photos, they really stacked up a lot of buffalo uh, hides and sent them right back down to St. Louis. Um, and then they returned east a lot, of, or they returned west a lot of times. They brought items with them that they could trade. I think that's where I was going with that, that they could trade the local tribes for furs um, and things like that. So they were bringing items in, and then they were shipping a lot of the fur items out uh, and down to, to the civilizations in the east. Um, but a lot of animals were really uh, decimated. A lot of animal populations were decimated in that time period. So that was kind of the end of the, the really lush plains, I would say, when you saw a lot of wildlife um, through the area. So the fur trade didn't last too long before we started getting steamboats up here. Uh, it's astonishing to me that steamboats were able to make it up this river. <laughs> it is, it's pretty shallow in a lot of areas. So when you float the river, you're going to be going over a lot of sandbars and gravel bars that are really shallow, shallow areas. And thinking about these massive steamboats that were coming up river here all the way up to where present day Fort Benton is. Beyond this, area, it gets to the falls, near Great Falls. So it was too treacherous to take steamboats really beyond Fort Benton. Um, so this was one of the last stops. Uh, but they, as you can see in that lower left photo, it, you can kind of tell there's a lot of what looks like wood and timber on that. They were going, they had what uh, steamboats employed what were called wood hawks, and they would go out on the landscape and cut down cords and cords of cottonwood to use to keep that, those boats fired up, uh, to keep those steamboats going. And so they almost decimated the cottonwood groves along the river at that time. Um, however, over time, since, since that period, the cottonwoods were able to naturally regenerate, thankfully, because they're a fast growing tree. Um, but just imagining going out and collecting cords and cords of wood just to uh, fire those ships. And I do apologize, I know there's a number for how many it took a day, and Michaela might be able to answer it at the end, but um, how many cords of wood it took per day to, to fire up those ships um, and get them going. So uh, a lot of wood was lost, but a very exciting time, brought a lot of prosperity to the area and really um, picked it up again um, with bringing homesteaders to the West. And so you started to see more people come out here looking for uh, you know, a new life, maybe looking to try their hand at, at farming or, or um, 
or just, you know, escaping that uh, life back east, the, the hustle and bustle. Uh, some people were also trying to escape the law when they came out, and that's not a secret, but, um, but definitely folks came out uh, and, and tried their hand at homesteading. And, you know, about 50%, I think, was the number were, were not successful. Um, so most people came out and had a rough go. Um, they would come out on the steamboats. They would purchase a wagon, usually a Murphy wagon, a very large, uh, you know, covered wagon that they would load up any goods they had or could purchase. And they would set out on one of the many road networks that had started to become established that left Fort Benton and either headed north or west away from the town. And they would just pick their, uh, their homestead. And a lot of times they would use the, the material from that Murphy wagon, that large wagon to construct their homestead along with uh, lumber that they could find on the landscape. And so these homesteaders uh, had a very rough life, as you can imagine. There's not a whole lot of good water in this, in this landscape that is accessible, uh, harsh conditions, harsh winds, harsh heat. Uh, brutal winters, and so it was a very difficult life, and you can see why most people um, eventually were not able to make a successful home here and had to leave. But those that did, those that uh, homesteaders that did end up staying, actually were really those first generation Montanans. Um, not long after, after this era, Montana became a state, and you have people that live here now, my neighbor's one of them, that say they're fifth generation Montanans. Their, their great, great, great grandparents were homesteaders here. Um, so some people became very successful in this life and, and really established Montana to what it is today. But we can't forget that Fort Benton is the birthplace, they call it the birthplace of Montana, because this is where people came out and really expanded from this, this location. Um, and, and so very important landmark, in my opinion, this town, and, and hopefully you get a chance to come and see the history. Now, when we come into present day, um, I hate that I'm grazing over all this history, but we just don't have a lot of time. Um, but coming into present day, um, the, the Wild and Scenic River portion uh, of the river was established in 1976. And so that's when this area was protected um, or had more protection than, than previously. And that's the section you'll float if you do come on the river. Um, and then we got the National Monument, which was a stat status, which was established in 2001. And that was by presidential proclamation. Um, and, and so that's when we really we're able to actually start, you know, establishing different areas for recreation within this landscape. Uh, the, the Missouri Breaks Interpretive Center was built a bit later and we have exhibits can help you with trip planning um, and give school programs throughout this facility and uh, throughout the year from this facility. Um, and that that's having that monument status is what helps us continue to provide those recreational opportunities and services to our visitors. So we're very excited to, to be able to do that for folks and to have those, those uh, protections that we can hopefully keep this landscape um, for future generations to see. As you're out there on the river, you're going to find a lot of recreation opportunities beyond just floating down the river, which uh, is, is a wonderful trip in itself, but definitely get out, stretch your legs. Um, you can, uh, you'll find again in the guidebook, a lot of trail or hiking opportunities that you can get uh, up on top of the bluffs or up on top of, um, you know, some of these white rocks, the white cliffs areas, there's the eye of the needle um, or uh, the hole in the wall area. I guess the eye of the needle was knocked down if I remember, but the hole in the wall area. Um, and then you can uh, also get up into some of those slot canyons, which are really fascinating to see. Um, if you're a fisherman, you can go out and, or fisherwoman, you can go out and fish. Uh, there are a lot of uh, species of fish in the river. We, of course, have the big paddlefish season that's coming up here. Gosh, is it already past? Yeah, it started May 1st. Um, so paddlefish season is open on the river right now. Um, we also have a couple species of sturgeon in there. I am not a fisher person, so I am not hugely uh, versed on the fish. Um, but we do, we do have quite a bit that, that attract fishermen. So I see boats going by a lot all day. 
Um, so if you're if you like to fish, I'd say it's a great place to do that as well. Um, birding, big opportunity for birding on the river. We also uh, allow hunting, um, you know, in season and, and at parts of the river. And then um, we also have those wilderness study areas that you can just go and observe. Uh, good, good place to observe wildlife and see places that aren't very, um, I guess, uh, impacted by people. So. Um, the other thing I guess I should mention, and I, I might mention it a little more, but um, you will see cattle on the river. Um, and that, you know, the monument, we do allow cattle grazing, and that is partnerships with the local ranching communities um, that border the river corridor. And we are working, we have our hydrologists and others that work closely with the ranches to try to develop water systems that are more in the uplands so that we can try to uh, get the cattle grazing more at a minimum along the river corridor. So we're trying to work to find ways to, to make it so that you all have that more wild experience, um, but that the cattle also have a water source. Um, so that is something you might see when you're, you're out there. Recreation opportunities in the uplands are also a possibility. So if you really wanna go on a good hike, set out, um, I'd say that the monument is open to uh, any adventure you can find out there. You, in the lower section, you can see you've got a lot more of those badlands, the pine uh, tree, the forests that you're gonna find. Um, whereas in the White Cliff section, you might, it might be a bit trickier to find those experiences uh, out in the uplands. But, uh, but just popping up a coolie, if you um, are feeling ad adventurous, can get you right up to the top pretty easily. Uh, so definitely get out and explore. Now, you might see some wildlife while you're out there. Um, we have over 60 or 60 species of mammals. Um, the one that caught me off guard was the moose. I had to include the picture. That was taken um, here along the river by a, a ranger that was here years ago. So there are opportunities to see moose out there, which is pretty cool. Um, I've seen quite a few porcupine on the river, um, up in the trees, eating, eating the cambium layer, I'm sure. Um, of, of some of those trees, but definitely keep your eye up in the, in the branches. Of course, as the foliage starts to come out, it's going to be harder and harder to see them, um, but they're out there. So keep an eye out for the porcupines. Um, you might see a coyote running across uh, or running along the shoreline. They, they like to come down and get a drink, of course, so you, you might get to see them, but most likely you're going to hear them at night. So uh, keep an eye out for those yips and howls at night or an ear out for that. Um, bats usually come out around dusk getting the, the bugs. I've already seen them some this year, so keep an eye out for bats. And then the most prevalent uh, animal you might see are the mule deer or the white-tailed deer. So those are, are probably the most common animal you're gonna see. Um, you could possibly see elk or pronghorn. I say it's more rare along the river, but you never know. There are some areas, some groves that you might see. Of course, the pronghorn would be more if you popped into the uplands. Um, and then bighorn sheep. So I, I was gonna include my good picture of our bighorn, but um, they are, are gonna be found more in the lower section. Uh, but the bighorn, it's apparently world renowned herd that we have here uh, in the area. So, you know, getting to see them is super special. Uh, and I hope you do. Um, as we mentioned the fish, we got 48 species of fish. Um, 20 species of amphibians and reptiles, and then 233 species of birds. So if you can spot all of those and check them off your list, you're doing well. Now, most of the birds and mammals are dependent on our riparian zones that you're going to find, and we'll talk a little bit more about riparian zones in just a moment. Um, but the birds, the bird species you're going to see uh, most commonly, you see a lot of eagles on the river, and that includes, I've seen both the bald eagles, especially during nesting time, which is right now, um, and the golden eagle I've seen. So they, they tend to like the cliffs a bit more, the golden, so keep your eye on the cliffs for those. Osprey, we uh, probably all seen the high um, osprey nests that a lot of times they make nests in the, uh, on telephone poles that people have constructed platforms for them uh, to use. So 
um, looking in snags or or just human constructed poles for the osprey nests. Um, what one of the really neat things that I like to distinguish between the osprey and the eagle are how they hold their fish. So osprey will hold their fish parallel to their body um, with their their claws, you know, kind of underneath them, one behind the other. Whereas or talons, I should say. Whereas the um, the eagle will hold their fish more perpendicular, more um, out to the side. And so that's that's one thing that you can quickly notice when you see them flying by with the fish. And it's it's really interesting to see a lot of Canada geese. So that's probably our most popular um, out here. And right now their babies are they have hatched and they're they're out little tiny yellow uh, fluffs <laughs> are out on the water with them right now. Um, so they are good to go. And then we've got a lot of songbirds moving into the area as well. Um, we saw our first pelicans last week, no, week before last. So the pelicans are here uh, moving into the river. I have seen the sandhill crane on, the, on some rock bars in the river as well. Um, mallards, shorebirds of all kinds. Um, we have, I know the killdeer have come in. Um, and then we were, we were seeing the, um, ooh, oh goodness, I'm not going to remember. It wasn't the, it's the one with the big bill. Somebody will probably say it in the, <laughs> in the chat section, but um, we have great blue heron that fly through, uh, the meadow larks and all the, all the grasslands, um, you'll hear them calling from there, and then the pigeons uh, on the rocky cliffs as well. So a lot of bird life going on. Um, and then plants, I, I just like to observe. That's when I'm in the wild, I like to look at every little detail and that includes all of our beautiful plant life that we have desert uh, areas, which I consider this some, uh, you know, a form of desert out here where you've got a lot of that high desert sage. Um, that, that's gonna be really prevalent on some of the hillsides. Um, but you, you'll see mostly cottonwoods in the riparian areas, willow, some ash, um, and then as you get lower in the river, down in the lower section, you'll see more of those pines we talked about in the juniper, uh, and even some Douglas fir. So very interesting dynamic and, and contrast as you go along. Um, the wildflowers, you know, we have a few cactus that, that will, um, or mostly just the, the prickly pear. I haven't seen the, um, is it the pin cushion? I think it is that, that cacti, um, but the prickly pear will start flowering. And then the yucca plants will, will start here very soon. Um, we could also get some aster and lupin and, and a lot of other small wildflowers that are of varying colors. I noticed when I put this together that we didn't have any color other than yellow in our wildflower, um, <laughs> in our wildflower folder. So I'll have to try to get some more color uh, varieties going. But a lot of uh, natural grasses and sedges and then, of course, there are, unfortunately, a lot of non-native species growing throughout our monument. And so we just really ask for your help when it comes to the non-natives and making sure that you're not taking any seeds and spreading them around through mostly your shoes uh, and socks. And that's especially that cheap grass likes to hold on to, to our shoes and socks, and then we take it other places and spread it. And then the biggest problem with non-natives is that they, they compete with the native plants and push them out a lot of times. And so uh, they dominate the landscape and they crowd other plants out. And that becomes a problem uh, for other wildlife, for plants and, or pardon me, for, well, for the plant native plants, but also for insects that rely on those natives and any other wildlife that use those plants for food or shelter. There, it's, it's gonna be a hard adaptation for them. So um, helping to try to slow the spread of non-natives by just watching when you walk through those areas and making sure you're not taking any seeds with you um, is, is really the best that we can do actively while we're out there. Um, so, you know, getting into the riparian areas, this is, we're, we're getting near the end of our journey uh, through the monument, but mostly you're going to see a lot of riparian areas as you're as you're out there, and they're going to be broken up between cliffs and rocky and, and barren areas. But you'll know them when you see them because they're lush; they're full of life. They've got a lot of trees, a lot of plant life, a lot of shrubbery, um, and and so they're and they're right next to the water. So it's that transition zone between the river that you're floating down and those upland areas. 
Um, and you're going to see mostly cottonwood groves in those areas. Uh, you'll see some willow as we as we had talked about um, and, and other small shrubs and grasses. But those cottonwood trees, they love it. They love those riparian areas because they are full of that moisture um, and, and they need a lot of water. Our riparian areas are essential habitats for, for the many species that call this place home. Um, thinking about, think about these areas as an oasis in the desert. Uh, they provide a lot of food, a lot of shelter, um, and they can, a place to cool off from the hot sun. And they do that for not just animals, but for us as well. So we, we all like to get the shade and get out of the hot sun. And riparian areas are a good place to find that shade when you're along the river. Um, uh, some parts of the, the zone might be a little more marshy or damp, but most of the time you can find good footing and, and sneak into the, the cool part of the forest while you're on the river and get some of that much needed shade. Um, unfortunately, our riparian zones are, are degraded by um, humans and our disturbances. Um, so just being very walking gently when you're you're in riparian zones, and that's why we ask. You know, we pack everything out that we pack in. We're not polluting. We're not cutting down trees. Um, we're trying to keep these sensitive areas, you know, healthy and and continuing for for all life on the river. Um, but the cottonwood trees are the big ones that, again, we go back to that because they are such a prevalent force, but they're also sensitive right now. Um, we, cottonwood trees, you all might have attended uh, Bonnie's presentation on cottonwood trees, and she went over that really well. And if you didn't, you can catch it on the YouTube page. Um, but they need so much sun and they need that water, a good source of water and that ideal soil. And so their life cycle, as Bonnie um, most likely went over, is they will uh, spread those cottony seed um, pods all over the place in the spring, and those are going to disperse on the river. On the, um, they'll, they'll also disperse across the landscape, but most importantly, they, they will um, get on top of that water and hopefully float to an area and uh, that they can get submerged maybe in a sandbar or rock bar um, and maybe start to grow a new tree. Historically, this area flooded heavily and it fluctuated, you know, with the seasons. You would have the spring flooding that would take place, and we don't get that as much anymore now that the river is dammed upstream. But when the area would flood, it would take all of those seeds and tumble them down the river. And then when the flooding was done, all the seeds would kind of lay on these new sandbars that were created by the flood. And they had all of that nice sunlight and all of that water and this perfect sandy soil and they could grow a new tree. And they all of those little cottonwood um, saplings, the little growths, they, you know, they're trying to hold on to that, that soil, that sand, um, sandy soil and get a good, um, get good growth going so that as they age and mature, uh, they can withstand those floods, those um, that, that occur. And because that process isn't really happening naturally anymore, we have to give it a boost. So um, uh, I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. But as the cottonwood grows, once it becomes somewhat mature, they're going to grow about six to seven feet a year. So they, they grow pretty darn fast um, and, and it's a, you know, provides a lot of habitat. Uh, for the local wildlife here and a lot of shade for us on the river. So we really want us to be on board with, uh, with keeping these cottonwoods healthy and, and growing for future generations to experience. Um, beavers also do a bit of damage on cottonwoods. So you might see that, that trundling that happens around the base where a beaver is making uh, some good headway on chopping down one of these larger cottonwood trees. Um, you know, it's, it's a natural thing, so it's hard to, to mitigate that. Um, I've seen people put fences around the trees to try to protect them from that damage, but that's another way that cottonwoods might, you know, have an impact or be impacted. Um, but the main thing is just not having that natural regeneration anymore. So um, we work right now with, with our friends group, with Michaela, and who, who has already um, come out and uh, done some planting this year. So our partner, um, the Friends of the Missouri Breaks, comes out and every year and plants new cottonwoods 
along the river. So some of you all might have uh, participated in that this year and, and helped. Uh, Michaela actually goes out before the volunteer day and will uh, cut a lot of those um, growths and put them in growth uh, hormone uh, water for a few days before taking them out to the site. And you all dig a lot of big holes in the ground and, and get those cottonwoods real deep into the soil. But the main thing is, coming back and watering them because we talked about the water they need. So, um, so you'll see volunteers possibly along your trip out there watering our cottonwoods as they go along. And anybody that wants to help with that, please call us and let us know or contact Michaela um, because we need all the help we can get to keep these cottonwoods growing. Um, it would be a pretty changed river if we you know, woke up one day and the cottonwoods were no longer here. So. Uh, let's try to keep that process going for sure. Um, you know, the friends do more than plant cottonwoods for us. They also help us uh, get, a, get the recognition and attention that, that this place needs to stay in the public eye and stay protected. And, and so Michaela works exhaustively uh, to do that by getting our mission out there uh, to the masses. And, and we so appreciate that. Um, we also work with a River and Plains Society here in town, and they donate a lot of artifacts and exhibits from the historical, uh, you know, times that, that occurred in this area for our exhibits here at the um, Monument Interpretive Center. So, so we have a lot of great partners that help us, you know, help you in the end, um, and we so appreciate that. One of the things to remember as we close out is that this is a shared space. Can you all see that? Did I go too far? There it is. So this is a shared space. Um, you know, it's, it's multi-use. We've got a lot of conflicts that happen on our monument. Um, and just keep that in mind when you're out there that you, you might see vandalism, you might see resource damage and anything that you do see, we appreciate it if you let us know so we can try to mitigate it um, and get ahead of it, but it does happen. Uh, that eye of the needle we talked about was one thing that was knocked over. You can see the photo here of the, used to be an arc on that photo that's the um, second one or the one down underneath the graffiti there. Um, and, and so things like that, it's, it's a shame that it happens, but it does. Um, but just helping us, you know, find out about it and learn is, is really important. We talked about the cattle grazing along the river and, and we do know that that is a concern for a lot of our floaters and something that we are trying to mitigate um, and just you know help the ranchers get their cattle the water they need, but also allow boaters to have that, that experience, that wild experience. So it is something that we take seriously. Um, Flooding, I, I included that even though it's not really a shared space thing, but it, it, you know, flooding occurs along this river even with the dams upstream. So it happens mostly you get ice jams in the spring that create some serious flooding along the river corridor. So you might get to campgrounds that were, uh, that could be closed along the river because of flooding damage. So just call us before your trip, let us um, know what your plans are and we can let you know what the, the most uh, current updates are. Right now, all of our campgrounds are open. Um, the uh, water is turned on at KIPP and the water will be turned on at Coal Banks coming up in, uh, May, on May 15th. So um, it's the season is starting and we're getting uh, ramped up already. But you'll notice that last picture down in the bottom of crowding, and that's crowding at um, Eagle Creek Campground. So, uh, so thinking about that on your trip as well, um, you could call us to see how busy it is if uh, right before you take your trip, and that might help you decide: Am I going to, you know, stop um, at Eagle Creek, or am I going to stop a little bit before at this dispersed camp I know of? Um, that might help you plan a little better so you don't run into a situation where there's overcrowding or you're not able to have a good experience. We want you all to have the best experience that you can while you're out there. And, and that's, that's really it is out there. Think, uh, you know, of all that history around you, um, you know, really just take in that solitude and enjoy those night skies that happen out there. They're just so wonderful, the big Montana skies. We have three locations that were just recognized as international dark sky locations within the monument. So you've got um, coal banks where you might start your journey. 
And then you've got Judith where you might end. And if you go on down to Kip, that's our third one. So really, uh, I, and just think of all of the little dispersed camping and, and sites that they didn't include that are within the monument. And, and you might have an opportunity to see the cosmos as you're out there camping, which is just makes you feel so small, but, but is a, a really fascinating sight um, to see. And with that, we just ask that you keep the river wild, protect that wildness of the river corridor and the solitude that it affords all of us. And thank you so much. And I am here to answer any questions that you may have. Hopefully I can answer. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Um, yeah, there's been several questions stacking up um, in the chat. So I'll just kind of jump into those. And um, so Bill asked, um, how can you find the TP rings at Little Sandy? And um, yeah, where are those? So I hiked up to them once. I, I was going to look in the guidebook and see. I, I looked through this at one point and I didn't see it. And I wanted to look again. But you had to hike up to the higher bluff, if I remember correctly. Do you know, Michaela? Yeah, so um, essentially you're going to head out if you're familiar with Little, little Sandy Campground. Um, you'll kind of head, um, get off at the main takeout near the um, pit toilets, and then you'll keep heading north. And there's a little fence line that has bluebird boxes on it, and you'll kind of follow that up along. And there's um, usually a social trail that's um, created out there. So that kind of follows along a fence line and takes you up a little bluff around the back. And it's hard, um, I'm gonna try to see if I can get a map up. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially you'll get up to the top of that little bluff, um, that first little bluff behind it. And it's on a point to your right hand side. Um, it's a little difficult to describe without, um, without a picture of the map. But, Typically, like I said, there is a social trail, especially later on in the season um, when people have gone through there that will lead you straight up. Um, but following that fence line and then shooting up just to the top, there's a couple different sites where you'll, um, you just have to be looking closely to see those big teepee rings. Um, but there's at least two of them in a couple different spots up, up on top of that bluff really short, quick hike. Um, so certainly worth, um, worth checking out. And I'll try to think of a better way to describe that and get yes. that info to you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, it was um, way better than I could do. <laughs> but we can jump into the next one. Um, I was in the breaks in 2017. Have the Dark Butte toilets been serviced since then? That's a yes. great question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, they have been serviced since then, and, and apparently they are, are good to go. That was the latest word. We had that question again recently. Oh, is that right? Good, good. That's, that's good to hear. Those were the composting toilets that they were having some difficulty with, and that was where um, we were running into that issue that Allison mentioned, where people were throwing wag bags directly into the toilets just filling that up with waste that does not compost and is not easily pulled out. So definitely gave the rangers um, quite a bit of headache to try to get that clear, cleared out. So that's awesome to hear. Um, in late August 2017, there was a rattlesnake, rattlesnake bite victim at Dark Butte. Anyone know what the outcome was? I no. do. I had not heard that. No, and I, I have heard from local Fort Bentonites that there has not been a rattlesnake fatality that they, at least, that they know of. Um, but, you know, I, that's just secondhand information, so I couldn't, I couldn't say that's accurate. But, but that, no, I don't know that one. Gosh, I will ask. And so a, a, another great reminder to always be uh, watching where you're walking. And if you're going through the tall grass to use the paddle method um, of sweeping your boat paddle in front of you to uh, stir up any rattlesnakes and let them know that you're there before, before your feet actually get there. Um, wow. So good question. It's good. I like that. <laughs> um, 
Another question, is there a newer version of the Fort Benton to Judith voters guide than April 2017 edition? Unfortunately, no, um, that is the newest version. And um, I have I, had any talk of it getting updated. Our transportation map is going to be updated this year, but that's the only document that I know that's gonna be updated anytime soon. But I will, I will try, you know, reading through it, I think we have noticed there are some things that need updated. So I'm sure it'll be on the docket soon but probably don't expect it for another couple of years. Yeah, I'm super excited to see the new transportation map. Um, that's gonna be really helpful. The breaks is, as you guys probably know, just an absolute patchwork of private and public and private, or private roads and public roads. So making your way through can be difficult. Um, and this new map should really be helpful to being able to navigate through that a little bit easier. So we're looking forward to that coming out. And that was something I, I forgot to mention and thank you for saying that. That was a big point that for some reason I didn't put in there, but um, you know, that's another thing that books help you with is distinguishing between the public and private land because you need permission to go to private land, whereas public land you can wander onto. So, I feel bad for forgetting that, but that, that is important to remember. <laughs> um, great, so another great question. Generally per year, how many paddlers are visiting the monument? What are the high and low traffic months? Ooh, have you, so being new here, that's, I'm gonna have to come back around to that one. Um, we just did calculations kinda mostly just by uh, the, the voter fees um, and what we could gather from that. So I'll, let me pull up, I'll come back around to that one. I'm gonna pull up our spreadsheet if I can and see if, if those numbers were tallied at least for last year. Sounds good. Um, yeah, we can kind of move down. Um, fishing, I guess you did mention that um, just the, the big number of fish. I mean, there's a ton of catfish in there as well. I think one of the first times I was on the river, I saw a fisherman pull a catfish out, probably the size of a small toddler. So, um, my goodness, <laughs> yeah, plenty of good catfishing out there. But, um, and you know, there's carp, and but all the there's better fish species as well. Um, unfortunately, I am also not an angler, so I um, know I can't really elaborate too much on that. Um, but it is pretty murky water, so that can make some fishing um, really difficult. The late right. season, early season, late season um, can get a little clearer. But. And I think, you know, here in the book, it talks about gold eye, sauger, walleye, and northern pike, and the catfish, like you mentioned, and then smallmouth bass, carp, and smallmouth buffalo. So, and of course, then you've got the pallet, the sturgeon, and, and blue sucker was another one. So those, out of the 40, I think species that those were the ones they mentioned, they must be the most common. Yeah, yeah, so that sounds all right. Um, can you recommend a good flower plant guide? Okay, so a lot of, a lot of folks um, recommend the plants of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, it's, it is really good for the whole route. So you're thinking, you know, you, it goes through their entire journey. So not just through the monument. So really only a section of it is for the monument, but people love this, this field guide for plants. Um, the other one, I have this one personally that I like, uh, Wildflowers of the Northern Great Plains. You'll find a lot of species that are local to the area in this book as well. Um, and, you know, the way that I use field guides is I usually have four or five open <laughs> trying to identify one plant because they're all different. Um, but this, I'd say these two would probably be your best bet for, for a field guide. And the Wildflowers of the Northern Great Plains is by uh, Vance, Jowsey, and McLean. So three, three people authored that one. Um, and then the one for the plants of the Lewis and Clark, that one is by Wayne Phillips. Awesome, yeah, those are great guides. Um, that Lewis and Clark one is really interesting and kind of cool to see the transition of 
of plants from the beginning of their trip to the end. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, let's see. The next one was the crowding worse last year with all the with all these new people in Montana. <laughs> Um, we did have a really big summer last year and, and it was worse from what we, you know, one of our rangers, we've had a lot of turnover in this, uh, at this site, but one of our rangers was here prior and he said it was, it was a lot busier. We expect this summer to also be very busy, mostly because people still are traveling internationally. Um, so we expect it to be even a little worse. And I would say from the amount of calls that we have received from January since uh, until now, it's gonna be a busy year um, for sure. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see if, um, see those numbers, if, um, yeah. if they get compiled um, to just the big difference because I have heard that as well, just quite a few more people out on I mean, just public lands in general are really getting really getting hammered, um, yeah. which is in a way great to see that people are finally recognizing what's uh, what's in their own backyard. But also need to take care of it. Um, so early September, good time in terms of less crowding. Question. Mm, I I'd say historically probably yes, um, and I think that holds true for a lot of of. Uh, you know, wilderness areas when families go back to school, um, you tend to see the numbers drop off, especially after Labor Day. Um, but I don't know. I, I have noticed a trend in years even before COVID where people were um, extending their seasons and recreating later and earlier, just basically take, creeping into the shoulder seasons. Um, I don't know if they've gotten hip to the fact that it is less busy in those times, or if they're just taking advantage because we have such a short season here. So we're just seeing it from beginning to end. Um, but I'd say a general rule of thumb is yes, September is probably gonna be a little bit less crowded than July or August, um, but it's hard to say. <laughs> and just being in mind too, um, those hunting seasons opening up, the breaks is really popular. For, um, as, you know, not just for boating, but for hunting as right. well. As the boating ground starts dissipating, the hunters do start moving in, so those campgrounds do start filling up, um, and you'll see kind of a different sort of crowd coming in. So that's mm -hmm. in mind as well. Hip was absolutely buzzing at the end of September last year, so. Oh no. Is, is, I can't remember, is that when the elk rut is, or is that later in October? Yeah, that's right around then, um, okay. late September, early October, I believe. Yeah. Um, GPS coordinates to the TV rings. That is that. <laughs> Bill, I will track those down for you. You will find the TV rings. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we'll have to we'll have to come back around. And Michaela, you're able to keep a list of, of these questions. Is that okay? So we can contact yeah. folks and yep. I will I will make it a mission. Um, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> they are they are really cool to see. Um, yeah. absolutely. It's amazing that they're still there and um, oh. people haven't people, animals, whatever haven't disturbed them. Um, it is really an amazing site. Um, so certainly worth <laughs> worth keeping um keeping track of me too bill don't don't let me forget <laughs> <laughs> um and that is the last in the chat does anybody else have any last minute questions that they uh they want to ask allison while we're on and i am so sorry i haven't found the numbers just yet for i don't know where where they got hidden but uh, well uh Definitely, if you do find those, um, we'll, we'll kind of broadcast those numbers somehow for you as well, either on social media or um, kind of in our newsletter probably as well. We wanted to do sort of a highlight on how the monument's um, been used in the last year or so. So uh, okay. we'll, we'll try to track those down and um, get those out to you guys as well. Um, but hearing none, I think um, we're... we're uh, right at the end here. So I'll kind of wrap things up. Um, and just 
Thank you so much, Allison. Of course, thank you for sharing so much of your time. We really appreciate it. Um, it's so great to, I'm really excited to get on the river. So it's great to see pictures, um, have all those really great reminders of how to be a courteous steward of the river. Um, that's really important that we're all just being the best stewards that we can for, for our monument. Um, and then thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, those of you who are here tonight and those of you watching on YouTube later, um, you know, we really appreciate you checking out this event and investing your time into learning more about monument. Um, that is really how you appreciate it to you the most. So um, again, I'll echo Allison. If you guys do have questions about planning your trip, please reach out to her, um, reach out to the friends. We're here to help. We want you to have the safest, most enjoyable trip that you can. So um, please, please don't hesitate to email, call, um, whatever. And then I'll just give another quick reminder that this year, the Friends and the Monument are celebrating our 20th anniversaries. And currently the Friends are in the middle of our 20th anniversary fundraiser. So if you want to support more programming like this and help us continue being a voice for the monument, um, please consider becoming a member of the Friends or donating online um, by going to missouribreaks.org slash donate. Um, any amount helps and will make a big impact on the monument. Um, and then also don't forget to sign up for our email list on our website and follow us on social media so you can stay up to date on all of our upcoming volunteer and stewardship activities this summer. Um, we're right around the corner from our first one in May where we'll be um, doing an interpretive center cleanup day with Allison again. So um, come on out for that one. It's real easy access and it should be a fun couple hours. Um, helping out the face of the monument. So um, thank you again, everybody. Um, I hope to see you this fall when we pick back up with a whole new lineup of Tune In Tuesday events. Um, and uh, hope you have a great night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.